Escaped Sapiens. Deepfakes are a kind of synthetic media that uses techniques from machine learning and artificial intelligence to manipulate or generate video and audio content with the goal of deceiving audiences. But there's also positive applications of synthetic media. In this episode of the podcast, I speak with Matthew Ferraro, who is an attorney and a visiting fellow at the National Security Institute with expertise in defense and national security, cybersecurity, and crisis management. We discuss the impact of manipulated media on society from a policy and legal standpoint. This is a tool that has the potential to produce movies in every language with perfect lip sync and to allow you to see what you would look like in that new pair of pants without ever leaving your home. It's also a technology that could be used to meddle in elections and to manipulate the stock market. Matthew creates a fascinating picture of a world we are right on the cusp of entering. From revenge porn and nuclear war, to reviving the image of deceased loved ones and giving voices to the mute. I hope you enjoy. So I'm hoping to discuss deep fakes and other technologies and their impact on media manipulation and their significance Mm -hmm. from a legal and political standpoint. But I suppose uh, to start with, you know, we've been manipulating media for a long time and we have tools like Photoshop and and, and other uh, suites. And so I guess a starting question is, you know, how important are these new technologies that are coming into play? You know, to what extent is this a revolutionary and epoch defining uh, change in which, you know, bot farms, you know, uh, troll, troll armies, deep fakes and all these tools are coming into play? And to what extent is it more of an evolutionary plod in the direction that we've, you know, always been going? I, I guess the question is, how, what's the significance we should give uh, to these new techniques and, and technologies that are coming into play uh, today? Yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. You know, you could say that you know, bearing false witness is, is an ancient vice, right? It's right in the Ten Commandments. And so it's not like lies, gossip, or indeed media manipulation with photographs is anything that's new. But while the vice is old, I do think the vehicles are new. And what's different now is the speed with which disinformation deep fakes can spread because of bot farms and other things, the scale, right? You release it anywhere in the world and it goes global uh, in, in nearly instantaneously. Um, the, you know, the verisimilitude of the media, the ability to create really, really believable synthetic media, mm-hmm. and also the credulity of, of people to believe it. And I think that has a lot to do with sort of broader social trends about the polarization of individuals, sort of uh, what's been called epistemic tribalism, the idea being that you believe what your tribe tells you to believe, tribe in sort of quotes, a political faction usually, partisan identification, and you'll find media to support it. And I've, I've tried this um, analogy, Shane, you have to tell me if this works or not. But I talk about how uh, I try to compare deepfakes today with conventional and nuclear weapons, right? Mm-hmm. Because if we'll think back to 1945, um, the, the United States dropped firebombs, conventional munitions on Tokyo in the spring of 1945. And that firebombing killed more people mm-hmm. than the atomic bombs did when they were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yet it was like the latter events that led to the immediate surrender of Japan and this sort of epical change in warfare. And I guess the question is sort of why, right? I mean, why was it so different? And that had to do with the efficiency of the weaponry, the uh, second order effects, the sort of trauma of you know, one plane, one bomb, and all these dead, and the potential for so much worse activity in the future. And so I feel like there's something to be said for deep fakes, which I refer to uh, somewhat ominously as atomic deception. The idea is that it's a paradigmatic shift in the way that uh, atomic weaponry was, even though conventional weapons in, in Tokyo, and I, I believe also in Dresden and Germany, uh, you know, actually killed more people, but it took more planes, and it didn't have the same sort of broad consequences that deepfakes do. When you think about deepfakes, and you think about, as I say, the, the real believability of the media, and then also increasingly the, dem- you know, so the democratization of the technology, so that more and more people are going to be able to create fake media. So all of a sudden, we all can depict someone using our phones. I think that has a, a very significant second order effect. Mm-hmm. So how long have these technology, well, how long have deepfakes been good enough that they're dangerous? That's a good question. I mean, I think the it was 2018, if I'm not mistaken, when Jordan Peele and uh, his co-collaborators, the American actor Jordan Peele, 
put together a deep fake of President Obama saying things he never said, uh, and then warning about manipulated media. So it's been very recent. I mean, a couple of years. And honestly, it gets better and better um, almost exponentially. It was only a few months ago, we're recording this in July of 2021, that, uh, that Chris Ume, a Belgian, Belgian-born video effects artist, he now lives live in Thailand, uh, created these uh, uh, deep fakes of Tom Cruise. And he used a, a, an impersonator, an actor who sort of has the same body type as Tom Cruise, and then fed into his, uh, and it was an open source AI model, uh, the ability to sort of all this sort of information uh, so that he could create this fake Tom Cruise face. But it was really only from, like, I think the mouth to the forehead. I mean, it wasn't that much space. And he created this of, um, of Tom Cruise, and they're just very believable. And then, then Chris Ume afterwards did a lot of post effects, post post video effects editing to make it even more believable. But those are very good, and that's you know only been a couple months ago. And again, that was done not by Hollywood effects artists, but by someone who essentially works on his own. And uh, the author Nina Schick, whom I, whom I know, and she's quite excellent. She wrote, I think, a book behind me. Deep fakes there, the coming in apocalypse. She she describes a I think it's an excellent example of the movie the De, um, not the Departed, the Irishman. That's right. Which this was the Martin Scorsese film where Scorsese tried to use visual effects, Hollywood visual effects, to de-age mm -hmm. his uh, actors because it was like a thirty-year epic, and it looked kind of clunky. And then somebody online used, using open source AI software was able to create even better effects mm -hmm. for the same, um, for the same movie. And again, that was like, I think Martin Scorsese made the film beginning in 2017. I think that's about right. And, um, this fella online created more believable deep fakes, you know, only a year or two later. So mm -hmm. it really is moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, but, but to answer your question, circle back, answer your question directly, it's only been about three, three years or so. Hmm. I guess uh, that's sort of my question, you know, with, with Chris Ume, I guess he had like a professional voice actor and, you know, he, he himself was quite skillful and had various, he had a background, right? So I guess right. my question is, to what extent, it sounds like it's getting to the point where someone with no real background and without a voice actor can produce realistic uh and believable deep fakes but at, at the moment right now is it the case that it's more sort of people with resources and sort of state actors that really have access to believable uh, deep fakes and it's going to be a no number of years before the every you know the everyday man can cause trouble well th that's an interesting question and i also noticed that you you sort of say um is it just uh, researchers or uh, nation states? And I think it's actually quite uh, remarkable that Chris Ume made those videos just on, a, on his own. So he did it. He is a, you know, I mean, I think he's a professional in the sense that he gets paid to do them, but um, he, he doesn't have like hundreds of people working for him. And I think he said something like, it took him a couple months to train the algorithm and it took him about 24 hours of post-production to make, make each minute a video, which sounds like a lot for a person, but I pointed this out on a different program that I did. You know, the, the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army 2nd Division, the 2PLA, their intelligence service, could put you know, 10,000 man hours against the creation of a deep fake tomorrow. So the idea that it takes 24 hours of post-production for a minute of, of believable video is really not that extraordinary at all. Uh, it, now, I think, and it is true that the best deep fakes are made by researchers or people who can train the AI models, can do post-production, can hire people who are believable actors. But that's, you know, that can include a lot of people in that denominator. MIT uh, researchers, in order to prove how easy it was to do these things, created a video of President Nixon reading a speech that he'd never, he'd never uh, actually read, but the speech had been written by William Sapphire what would have what would have happened if the Apollo and astronauts had not been able to blast off mm -hmm. from the moon? They had uh, if Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had to um, live out the, the remaining hours of their life on the moon, and I believe it was called "In the Event of a Moon Disaster." Mm -hmm. And so the speech had been written, and to prove how easy it was, or how how much easier it was becoming to do a deep fake, they created a, a speech of Nixon's where they edited an old speech that he had given a different speech. 
they had hired a, uh, someone who could uh, who's a, more or less be used as a stage model as they put Nixon's face on top of him to, um, to read this speech. And I also believe that they manipulated the voice as well to sound like him. And again, they did that in a couple months. I think uh, something that you'll start seeing a lot more of, Shane, is what I'm referring to as deep picks as a service or mm -hmm. DFAS, you know, like you think of SaaS software as a service. And this is a, a business model, essentially, where and Chris Ume founded a company a couple of weeks ago called Metaphysic, and they want to sell their, their wares, and he should, I mean, in the sense that he's incredibly talented, so that you can go to him and say, I want to create a deep fake for my awareness campaign. This is, I mean, this has happened already where they wanted David Beckham to speak in a dozen different languages to promote the use of nets against malaria. And they used deep fake technology to change his mouth so that it sounded like he was speaking in Swahili and, and uh, every, you know, uh, uh, other Pashto language that they wanted him to speak in. And so, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be up. So the, the, to answer your question, there'll be a time, maybe it's a couple of years from now, where using my phone, I'll be able to create a deep fake using just, you know, as simple as possible interface, software interface. I think the more immediate step is that you're going to have these businesses and entities that are going to be able to sell the service. So you'll say, uh, well, let's take Tom Cruise, right? I, he would never have a need to do this, but let's just use him as an example. Let's say he wanted um, to make some extra money on the side by promoting car dealerships in Southern California, right? Yeah. But he doesn't want to bother actually having to go and record commercials because he's Tom Cruise and he wants to live on the island he lives on or just you know spend his time without having to actually record the commercials. He can just license, the idea being, license his likeness to the car dealerships, they hire Chris Ume and his team at Metaphysic, and they create commercials, and perhaps they hire the same body double um, uh, stand-in for Tom Cruise to create these commercials, and that's it. He's just like so. He's basically his likeness is get is working while he's off uh, hanging out by the swimming pool. So I think that's going to be the more immediate step. The idea being that people can be able to access the software through DeepFix as a service through sort of intermediaries. So there are some positive applications. Yeah, there are. I mean, it's interesting. I tend to be more skeptical than others um, because I think that the truth has an intrinsic value, right? So the fact uh, that something did or didn't happen, that Tom Cruise did or did not shoot that that um, commercial actually has an intrinsic value. Basically, the idea being that that things that actually occurred in real life is are better, um, mm -hmm. just in some sort of basic sense than things that didn't. But there are positive use cases. I pointed to some of them. You know, accessibility is often uh, used as an example. The idea that you could change things into languages. There's another uh, company that now says that they're going to be able to dub movies mm -hmm. into uh, any foreign language and move the lips of the movie stars. Which would be amazing. That, yeah, they, they, they've they've done this already. For they have a mock-up for A Few Good Men. The the famous scene with Jack Nicholson saying you can't handle the truth. They've done that in like a dozen different languages. And again, the idea is they can do it at scale, basically any number of languages, much more believable uh, than just having the audio uh, literally pasted over, uh, well, really just recorded over the, uh, the original footage. So like there's that, um, there's in the voice clone, which is, you know, basically a, a, a kind of deep fake. It's not an image, it's just a voice. This is uh, the idea of to replace voices for people who have lost them because of illness. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea that I think Roger Ebert uh, was the first one, if I'm not mistaken, to use an early version of, of, of a deep fake clone. Roger Ebert was an American cinema, cinema critic, film critic. And there were, you know, hundreds of you know, thousands, thousands of hours of him mm -hmm. speaking, recorded. And he lost his voice because he had throat cancer, I believe it was. And they had to remove his larynx. And they created a, uh, a voice box form, a bit like Stephen Hawking. But instead of it sounding like a computerized voice, it was his voice. Because they could train it on hundreds of thousands or thousands, at least hours of, of him speaking. And indeed... We are recording this just a couple of days after they did a, uh, that is to say, a documentary film about Anthony Bourdain, The Chef, was released. And in this film, they used an AI synthesis 
to create, um, uh, make it seem as though Anthony Bourdain was reading an email that he had written which was totally manufactured. They didn't have, I mean, he, he didn't read an email. They just created a voice to make it sound like it for the drama. And there's been a bit of blowback. Again, this is just sort of happening today where people are saying this is unethical. They should have labeled it and so forth. It was up to a critic to realize that there was no way that they could have gotten a recording of him, of him reading his own email. Uh, but again, they built it. There's a way now. So that was seen as a privacy violation, but there's a way to see that as, you know, bringing somebody back to life. It, oh, I'll, I'll give you another example of a positive use case where you know, people have been involved, parents have been involved, loved ones of deceased people, mm -hmm. uh, people have been died because of gang warfare and so forth, being reanimated to speak out against gun violence and gangs it's happened in Canada and a few other places, Florida as well. So there's that. And then there is movies, uh, a sort of an uh, orthogonal, I should say, example is in the most recent Star Wars movie, Star Wars episode mm -hmm nine which was uh, you know created several years after carrie fisher who played princess leia had died but they wanted princess leia to be in the final uh, final show final movie and her family agreed so they didn't use deep fakes per se but they were able to sort of cut and splice and use some digital trickery to use old footage to put her into that movie and in a couple of years or whatnot they would have been able to just simply create her mm -hmm. similar to the Tom Cruise video. So again, to be able to put somebody in a movie uh, post-mortem and, and that sort of thing. So there are some, I think, positive use cases. I, I guess, you know, again, I'll give you another advertising is another example, right? Where the idea is you uh, watch a commercial for a pair of pants, a pair of slacks, pants is what we say in the U.S., pair of slacks. And, uh, and all of a sudden it's you, like you look at it, you look at the commercial <laughs> and it's you because the computer has access to your avatar. And so you see yourself wearing those pants. You say, oh, I look, I look good in those uh, chinos. I'm going to purchase those right away. So that, that would be an example. Or a movies, again, you watch a movie trailer and it's, it's starring you. You know, you're, you're, all, you're playing <laughs> cards with, uh, with Matt Damon or Brad Pitt or whatever. So there are lots of those sorts of applications. That's both creepy and awesome. I, I, suppose, <laughs> <laughs> I suppose something that's not, I, I can't, I don't know if it's positive or negative, but you know, it's only really recently in the last 10 or so years that everyone's had a smartphone. So everyone's had mm -hmm. access to a high quality recording device. And I guess if deep fakes become widespread, then the doubt that they also, do, do you think it's possible that they might take us back to a pre smartphone era where, where we don't have access to, you know, trustworthy footage of events? Oh yeah, I mean, Shannon, I think you've really hit on something. So this is called, uh, often referred to as the liar's dividend. And that's, uh, I should give credit where it's due. That was a term coined by professors Bobby Chesney at University of Texas School of Law and Danielle Citrone at the University of Virginia. Two great professors, I'm proud to say I know them both. And they call this a liar's dividend. And the idea is that it, it, it empowers the liar because anytime uh, there's some kind of media that portrays the liar in a negative light, they can just claim that it's fake, right? And so the sense that everything can be fake is a dividend that accrues to the liar. It's a benefit that accrues to the liar. And I've tried my hand at coining my own term, I call it the, del the zealot's dividend, the, the dividend for the zealot. And the idea there is that it isn't even per se the subject of the video, but someone who is just a zealot and wants to you know, support the liar and it gives them a reason to dismiss any media that doesn't show their preferred person in a, in a positive light. Mm. I'll give you two quick examples of that. Uh, one is uh, the liar's dividend would be former President Trump has now reportedly, I think it was Vanity Fair reported this, said that the Access Hollywood tape in which he is on the audio record claiming, uh, admitting and bragging about grabbing women, you know, sexually assaulting women was a fake. So that would be the liar's dividend. And then the zealot's dividend in my taxonomy w would be an example of that uh, would be that we had this terrible insurrection just a mile from my apartment where I'm sitting from you now at the U.S. Capitol. And then the next day, President Trump, former president, appeared on television to disown the rioters and you know, to claim that they weren't his people. He sort of changed his tune now, but he said that then. And supporters of him on Parler, 
which is a social media site, said, oh, that's, he would never betray us. He would never uh, condemn us. That was a deep fake. And actually the same sort of zealots have said that Joe Biden videos of him are deep fakes because they think that he's you know, iller than, the, uh, than the, he, he appears. He doesn't appear mm -hmm. ill at all. So in any event, um, so th that's, I think, a, a, real, a really important negative aspect of deep fakes, which is that it just shows that it basically is a permission structure, right, to, to doubt the veracity of media so that any autocrat can claim that footage of him arming his own people, committing war crimes, is a deep fake. Uh, there's a funny, you know, Onion article about a cheating husband, you know, who said the Onion is a satirical newspaper, I should say satirical website. And it was like, you know, the AI researcher says that any footage of him cheating on his wife is a deep fake, you know? Um, yeah. So like, so <laughs> sort of that idea. Um, and again, it's, what happens when seeing isn't believing? Well, you start to sort of default to your core belief set, the sort of the partisan loyalty, loyalty, the epistemic loyalty I, I mentioned at the top of our talk. So I think it's a real serious concern. I guess also in practice, it's not like all the deep fakes are going to be acting in unison, pointing in the same social direction, right? You're going to have competing voices, you know, putting deep fakes into the, into the, you know, social media landscape. One, one question I'm kind of curious about is, you know, there are millions of people uh, on, on online. And so, mm -hmm. you know, how is it that deep fakes are going to have, you know, and also bot farms and, and, and um, troll armies, this sort of thing. How, how are they able to have a purchase in, in this landscape when, when you have just so many actors? Do you, do you need mm -hmm. to have a, a state body behind uh, these sort of, uh, approaches or, or, you know, is, is there just some uh, critical density uh, that you have to, you know, of deep fakes and, and disinformation that you have to inject before there's a sort of organic pickup of misinformation? So two thoughts. The first is there are certainly ways to push things virally online with a relatively small input. And that has to do with, you know, who are the amplifiers? Also, what is the kind of the media, you know, the more outrageous it is, the more amplified it becomes because people attack it and support it. So there's a sort of ping pong effect. But I also think that's point one. Point two is it depends a bit on what the goal is. And certainly for a lot of autocrats, China, Russia, particularly Russia today, the goal isn't necessarily to make you believe any particular thing. It's to make you doubt everything. Mm -hmm. It is a sort of challenge to the idea of an, an epistemic reality that we share. And that's why a lot of these lies are contradictory, are, you know, they don't make any sense. Uh, you see this a lot in the, the disinformation around the U.S. election, which has been so serious, you know, that there, there are millions of fake ballots, but then also the machines were corrupted. But um, somehow all the other members of Trump's party were elected legitimately, but he was somehow uh, defeated illegitimately. It just doesn't make any sense, but you just become so exhausted by... Mm -hmm the competing narratives uh, that you just sort of throw up your hands. That's at least the concern. And now add to that, right, many more videos, believable videos. So let's go back to the Capitol insurrection for a moment on January 6th of 2021. The people who did that, and it was a terribly violent, five people died, a woman was trampled, um, police officer died, two others committed suicide, just horrible, event, they were, those individuals were driven to delusion by disinformation that was as simple as it could be, right? I mean, the, the lies about the election, that it was stolen, it wasn't, that it was unfair, it wasn't, it was fair, were just simple written and spoken lies, right? There was no deep fake evidence. But now imagine how much deeper 
those delusions would have set if there was a video of, say, campaign workers wearing Biden for president t-shirts, shredding ballots that were marked for Donald Trump, or a grainy undercover footage of Democratic politicians like Nancy Pelosi and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez meeting with Georgia elections officials to quote unquote rig the election. That would have been just so much worse, I think, because it would have set so much deeper in the psyches of, of millions of people. And to your point, I think that in an all out information war, you're going to have many different claims ricocheting around the internet. And they're not, it's not going to be clear which, what they're true. You know, there, there'll be footage of, you know, say, let's just say there's a war between uh, heaven for fan, the United States and China. I hope it never comes to pass. But there'll be videos of Americans committing war crimes, or appear to be war crimes against civilians, right? Um, and then maybe there'll be uh, videos of Americans surrendering to Chinese troops, or Chinese being greeted as liberators, or perhaps of, in this scenario, if it's an invasion of Taiwan, if, you know, if, if it, the, the, the proximate cause of this hostility is a Chinese menacing of, of Taiwan, the Taiwanese president going on television and uh, welcoming, welcoming the Chinese or, or conceding defeat or you know, ordering all of his people, his or her people to stay in their homes. There'll be questions of whether or not this is, that's a legitimate video, a, a true video or one that was created specifically for that purpose by the Chinese. And I suppose the questions could be the same for the Americans, whether we would engage in that kind of stuff, uh, I think is unlikely given, given our legal strictures against that, but, but I think it would be an open question. So at least it could be an open question. So, um, it's just a long, just a long way of saying that we're in a real messy environment, a very messy information environment. And but so, and it's primarily foreign state actors that benefit from that sort of messy environment. Like who who seeks to gain primarily? Oh, that's that is a good question. I think the truth is that the liars get all kinds of benefits, right, from all sorts of manipulations. You know, I've toyed with different taxonomies. Uh, you know, I work primarily in for private companies, so it's you know what are the what are the threats to the to private actors? Uh, so I'll give you those, and we can sort of expand on that. So I think that the disinformation and actually, let me take a quick parenthetical. So I think of deepfakes as a real accelerant on disinformation in general, viral disinformation, conspiracism. Um, those have been around forever, and deepfakes are just for all the reasons that we've been discussing, making it much, much worse. So I, I think sometimes we don't want to think only about deepfakes and sy synthetic media as the problem because it's only a small part of the problem. It's a very significant part in the sense that I think the danger is very significant because of this believable media and what that means for our sense of truth. But when we, when we think about it, I think we have to think about it in the broader context of disinformation. Okay, close parentheses. So, <laughs> so when I think about disinformation and the threat actors, I talk about trolls. So those are people who just don't like companies or businesses or any kind of target for any number of reasons. They're personal, they're political. Um, in the vaccine context, they have you know, very strong ideological views against vaccines. So those are people who spread disinformation or, or will use synthetic media for those sort of reasons of personal animus. Uh, the next is profiteers, people who want to make money using disinformation and deep fakes. And this is a problem now, I think it's become a very significant problem because it, it dovetails so easily with the sort of typical cyber hacks that we see and other kinds of fraud, cyber frauds. So that would be things like using disinformation and manipulated media to trick someone into thinking that you're a trusted person, that you're Shane from IT, and you're calling me because I've got a bug on my work laptop, and you just need my user credentials to help get that bug off. And 
And maybe you look like Shane from IT because there's a photo of you online or several photos. And so you call and we do a Zoom call because to save money, you're in a back office somewhere. You're not someone who works down the hall from, assuming we're in a post-COVID environment, we could actually go to the office. And so you get access to the IT system and you can steal intellectual property, you can steal financial information and all of that. And there've been some examples of people using voice clones to trick people into um, mm -hmm. what's referred to now as business identity compromise, that is that someone you know, sees someone's identity. And they've done that before in a, in a pre-media, pre-synthetic era using spoofing. So I get an email in this context called business email compromise. I get an email that looks like it's from the CEO. It says, you know, CEO's name at company.com. And he asks me to wire $100,000 because of some immediate deal he's doing. And maybe because they've accessed his email, they know that he's in China right now or in, in Tokyo. And, and he says, I'm in Tokyo right now doing this deal. I need $100,000 wired immediately. And so I do it. And it turns out that, that it was a spoofed email and the guy's actually in Estonia or something like that. Um, and the bank account is in Estonia, right? So like, so this is a, a, a some sort of manipulation of that. Uh, there's also profiteers also benefit from market manipulation, and that's an area where reputational harm, I think, is very significant. And one can imagine all kinds of examples of this. And w there is a lot of this in the classic disinformation space. So somebody will send send out tweets or social media posts or set up a fake website promoting uh, a stock, mm -hmm. and it goes up a lot. And it turns out that it was all bogus. They were posing as some you know, industry insider, or they're not. Or they spread, you know, false rumors about a stock and it drops. And if you're a fraudster, you've taken either a long position betting on the increase in the value of the share or a short position where you take out a contract basically betting on its fall and you can net real money. And I should say in the U.S., we have something called the Securities and Exchange Commission, which regulates the financial markets. And they regularly bring lawsuits and criminal actions against people who benefit from disinformation in that way. And again, now we use our... Um, uh, our, uh, we put on our imagination hats and we can see how much worse this can get with synthetic media. It's not just now a press release or a tweet about a merger or an acquisition that's mm -hmm. not going to happen. It's phony video of, uh, of the CEO shaking hands and they're saying we're looking forward to this deal. Or uh, there's someone who made this observation in another context, but I think it was last year or two years ago that Elon Musk, the eccentric billionaire yeah. uh, went on the Joe Rogan podcast, uh, which is as a, has a video component, much like ours. And Joe Rogan uh, and Elon Musk was on and Musk started smoking marijuana. And the next day, Tesla stock dropped 6%. And I think there were some other reasons. It was because he did that interview and seemed so out of unusual, out of sorts. Uh, and also there was like shakeups, I think, at Tesla. But if you're... A short seller with access to manipulated media, the creation of manipulated media, you could create that situation, right? You could just release a video of Elon Musk doing that. The stock drops and you benefit from the short. So that is like, those are just some examples of how profiteers would benefit. Uh, and then I, the third category is foreign flags. And that uh, we talked about before, again, in the, in the private sector context, the idea here is that foreign countries, governments, seek advantage by harming private companies. So mm -hmm. basically, usually to, usually to benefit what are referred to as their national champions. So one example of this happening already is Russia through RT America, which is their Kremlin-backed television channel, has been for months, if not years, hyping baselessly the dangers, the health dangers of 5G technology. This is the cell phone technology and claiming it causes cancers, cancer and Alzheimer's and all these things that it doesn't do. And the belief is that Russia is doing this because they see 5G tech as a kind of competitive advantage the United States has over Russia. And so they want to harm it as much as they can. And by doing so, of course, the harm falls on private companies because in the US, this kind of, these kinds of investments are done by private companies. Similarly, we've seen similar issues with um, vaccines where the Chinese information actors have been pushing disinformation about the inefficacy or dangerousness of US-backed vaccines. And there are many other examples you could, one could imagine across all kinds of industries. Uh, the, the, one more I'll give, and this is a really long answer, 
would be <laughs> what I call a campaign dirty tricksters. So this is obviously in the political context, so less on, this is, this is actually less relevant to the private sector and more to politics. But that is the benefit, that, and we see this all the time now online, of people pushing just false information, disinformation, and now manipulated media about candidates, uh, about political causes. And I, it's that finds such, such rich soil, I think, because of the deep partisan cleavages in the country and elsewhere. Anyway, I guess so there's, that, that's a variety of threat actors. One of the scariest, you know, our whole monetary system is trust based, right? Yes. So if, if so, if you destroy trust, uh, you know, you 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 have a well timed attack. I, I mean, are governments worried about protecting things like the central bank or, you know, the yeah. these key pieces I mean, I, I of infrastructure so. that are. Yeah, I think that that's right. I mean, early on uh, in this disinformation wars, there, I think it was the Syrian Electronic Army, which was a, which is a pro uh, um, uh, pro Assad, President Assad military division. They 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 hacked into. I want to say it was the Associated Press's Twitter account, but. Don't don't quote me on that, but you know, <laughs> um, you know, warning out there that I, that's just a guess. But I think it was the. I AP. might put a correction down the bottom. <laughs> okay, good. Put a correction down. where they they it was a news site where they they claimed that there was an explosion at the White House and the stock market dropped radically, you know, uh, hundreds of points. Now rebounded when when they realized it was just a hoax. But again, that will get so much worse if there is falsified media to back it up. So. I do think it is a concern. The U.S. government is is very concerned about manipulated media. We have something called the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, which is a, a, a Defense Department-backed uh, organization that researches cutting-edge stuff. We could sell technology. They, they invested in uh, GPS. They created the first internet, the DARPA net. And they've spent tens of millions of dollars now uh, through their media forensics program and elsewhere to try to do defect detection work because mm -hmm. I think they recognize the danger. There is also just a, you know, a clear command and control concern. Uh, imagine, no, of course, the U.S. is leaving Afghanistan, but imagine if the U.S. soldiers were there and they got, they were out for patrol, say, a platoon was out for patrol and they got a radio communication that said a convoy of trucks coming down the road were Taliban fighters and they should fire on the trucks and they do. And it turns out that it wasn't the Taliban at all, but a wedding party. And the radio transmission was not genuine, but in fact from the Iranians or the Chinese or has some geopolitical angle that would cause you know, very serious damage to us, um, uh, credibility in the in the region uh, and could very well lead to greater violence and so forth and of course also leads one should say to the death have of, attacks like that happened no not that i'm aware of mm -hmm. um when well, and the quintessential like nightmare scenario would be say that it would be like kind of a composite attack so say in the geopolitical context uh th let's take the u.s relationship with the the North, with the North Koreans, the Democratic People's Republic of, of Korea, the DPRK. So relations between the U.S. and the DPRK are always, you know, tense. They're particularly tense around periods of military maneuvers. So assume this is all time to happen when the U.S. and the South Koreans, the Republic of Korea, are conducting military exercises on the peninsula. And uh, let's say that there's they've created uh, some party, maybe it's the Russians or really anyway, it could be, it could be a nation state actor or someone who just seeks to benefit from war, creates a very believable deep fake of President Biden announcing a missile strike on North Korea. And let's assume as well that this is a very well-timed attack. So during this period in the run-up, whoever the, the malefactor is, whoever the bad actor is, has found a way to hack into the Twitter account or some social media account of the White House, the Defense Department, or some US government account. But they've laid in wait. They haven't used that access for anything yet. And so then along uh, comes the military exercise. Tensions are high. 
And then the malefactor sends out using this White House account, Defense Department account, this deep fake, this announcement of President Biden announcing that he is, because for the safety of the world, uh, uh, acting on recent intelligence showing the perfidy of the North Koreans, launching a preemptive military strike against Pyongyang, and it goes viral instantaneously. And the White House doesn't know what to do because it looks like it came from their account, but, um, but they didn't send it. And maybe they tried to delete it, but it's already been retweeted a million times. And now the Kim regime, regime, beg your pardon, the Kim regime in Pyongyang sees the video. They're not sure it's true. Maybe they only think it's, there's a 10% chance it's true. But are they really going to sit back and take, uh, just blindly take a, a missile strike that's going to end the regime, the whole raison d'etre of the entire country for 70 years? Perhaps not. And then they launch what they think is a retaliatory strike against Seoul, which is only, what, 20 miles, 30 miles from the Korean border. And millions of people die because of a fake video, because there was no U.S. strike. Uh, and then, because, then when the Koreans attack Seoul, then, then the U.S. really does have to ask whether or not they're going to think that's a one-off, or are they going to attack um, to prevent a full-scale invasion? And then China gets involved, Russia gets involved. Right, that. right. It's a bit like the run-up to World War I. You know, it just sort of starts a cascade of events. So that, that's a real, that's like the true nightmare scenario. And thank goodness that hasn't happened yet, but uh, hopefully never would. But that is the kind of thing that I think is on the table, given this technology. So to what extent are countries already invo involved in sort of these gray zone conflicts with one another? You know, is, is it just happening all the time uh, behind our backs and not what's going on there? What's the status? Yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, I, I think it was Oxford that had a study that 70 co countries, 7-0, have disinformation units. So these are units that, that push disinformation um, about their adversaries. So I, I think that it it's, can be very aggressive. I mean, you see it today in what's referred to as like wolf warrior diplomacy by the Chinese government. And it's like a kind of a mix of disinformation and sort of misconceptual, mis uh, what am I trying to say? Decontextualization, beg your pardon, <laughs> decontextualization of information. Um, so where there's like a nugget of truth, right? But they completely, uh, they, they, they uh, speak of it in a very misleading way. Sometimes they'll wander the, the, the disinformation, right? So it'll be tweeted about here, and then it'll be picked up over here by a blog and then it'll be picked up over here by like a semi-reputable news outlet and then it'll be sort of retweeted by a more reputable news outlet and then it'll be promoted again by the state's official um, mm -hmm. you know, PR or communications division. So there's a kind of laundering. You're never quite sure where it came from. So I think that happens. Uh, I wrote a, about a year ago now with a dear colleague uh, uh, and friend of mine uh, called that we called the disinformation attacks on business by states would be the next gray zone conflict. And I should, I guess, pause to say that gray zone is the is a term of art that means the space between diplomacy and war. So sort of all the areas of state competition that aren't purely di di diplomatic, but aren't kinetic uh, in the sense that there's actually you know, bullets being, uh, guns being fired and bullets flying, that sort of thing. I guess the benefit there for smaller nations is it puts them in an evil footing. I mean, they don't have to invest in expensive military tech. They, it's sort of like a, um, I don't know what you want to call it, but it's a leveler. Yeah, no, I, th I think that that's right. I mean, disinformation is cheap. Um, and, and I think that's right. I think that, it, that, that given all the factors that we sort of talked about before, the, the way in which disinformation can spread, um, uh, the scale and all of that means that you don't need that much of an amplification. Now, it, it does help, right, to have access to bot farms and trolls or just thousands of people who can sit at computers and, um, and push things out. It doesn't have to be that automated. But again, it's, it's relatively cheap. Um, and I mean, in cyber is an area where, talking about North Korea again, they're quite adept. I mean, the North Koreans have been conducting cyber frauds and cyber attacks for years um and i don't think it's too hard to think of them using 
disinformation, synthetic media, if they get to it, to conduct frauds, uh, to prop up the regime, because again, that's a regime that's in desperate need of cash. Is it, to some extent, uh, Western demo- you know, English speaking democracies more prone to these sorts of attacks because they're, I guess they're diverse and they're open. And I guess there's less, say, Americans who speak Chinese than Chinese who speak, you know, English. Mm. And I guess there are more, you know, there's probably less Americans that speak Russian than, you know, yes. and so on. Is, yeah. is this, is this, uh, the case or? I think that that's right. I mean, you know, this is a problem of openness, right? I mean, uh, as I understand Chinese internet law, you can't have an, an anonymous account in China. Uh, so mm-hmm. they, they have less of a personal individual disinformation problem than they have a liberty problem. But in the US, we have this open system. We have a first, you know, vibrant First Amendment, which means that the government can't ban um, disinformation about the election or disinformation about vaccines. And I've tried very hard to use, uh, I think the government has you know, private sector partners to promote mm-hmm. in, true information about vaccines, true information about the, uh, the election. But again, this is a cacophonous society. The, the idea is, longstanding idea is that you battle bad speech with more speech. And I think that is a problem for the West. Uh, it also has to do, I think, with our media model, especially in the U.S., where nonprofit media and press is relatively rare. So you have for-profit media that wants to drive clicks and engagement and what drives clicks and engagement, but interesting things, outrageous things, salacious things that can sometimes be disinformation. So you have to rely more, I think, on journalistic ethics to try to have them filter it out, which is, uh, I think, harder to maintain these days, given the various financial pressures that media companies are under. Have there been examples uh, in which deep fakes have been shown or proven to have swayed elections or to have led to coups or, you know, are there, is there any sort of high level impact that's already happened in any countries so, in the world? Yeah, I think there's this famous case of Gabon in 2018. Mm-hmm. So there, the president, whose name is Ali Bongo, he had been ill uh, quite for some time. And he was abroad, I believe he was in Saudi Arabia, uh, and he released a video in part to prove that he was alive. It was like a proof of life video. But military opponents of the president, uh, of Mr. Bongo, claimed that the video of him was, uh, was in fact a deep fake. So this is <laughs> sort of the, the liar's dividend, and that he was in, incapacitated or dead. And so this conspiracy spread that the president was dead, and that this, and if you do watch the video, this isn't to explain it at all, or excuse it at all, but he, he looks odd. I think he had Botox, his eyes look funny. Um, it's an unusual looking video. So this conspiracy that it was fake spread and there was a coup uh, and, and people were Im- imprisoned and, and killed. They, they took the radio station uh, and then the coup was eventually put down. So that, that is a, like a real world example of, of concerns over disinformation. Again, they believe that it was real. Uh, they took the video and they analyzed it. A professor at the State University of New York analyzed it and he said, I forgot the percentage, you know, it was like 90% sure it was a real video, it was not synthetically altered, but kind of the cat was out of the bag by that point and there was this coup. So um, yeah, that would, be, that would be the first real world example that I can think of. It's funny because it, there was actually no... Uh, deep fake is just the existence of the deep fakes uh, in general is what caused that issue. I suppose. And I guess one of the issues is you can throw out this information and the time scale in which you can verify is much longer than the time scale in which this can cause trouble. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, that's, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's two thoughts. One is, and people have asked me this, you know, the liar's dividend is basically premised on the idea that people know about deep fakes, so they know enough to not believe their eyes. And does that then mean that we should talk about deep fakes less? And my, my view is that these exist to a sufficient degree that you still need to engage in public education. But I think concomitant with that public education is a discussion of the liar's dividend and the importance of, of engaging in healthy skepticism which in some ways is to interrupt this 
a rush to believe, right? So you see a video, you believe it's true, and then you learn later that it's false, or at least someone gets around to claiming it's false. So I think that part of it is to inculcate a certain rigor in one's own analysis and in sort of social analysis to say, let's wait and see. So that would be one, one hope. But again, I think it's, it's difficult just human nature being what it is. I think people are going to believe what they want to believe. There are also, I mean, there are other, there are other factors too. I mean, there's things you can do technologically to slow down the spread of disinformation on social media. Yeah, you know, one thing I, I, I think is very helpful on Twitter is if you try to retweet an article that you haven't read, it'll ask you if you want to read it or at least click on the link. Like, I think that that, I think that's fabulous. I, I don't know, I'm sure there's been studies. I don't know how successful that is stopping the spread of disinformation, but I think that it almost intuitively would make sense that they at least must stop it at least some of the time. So perhaps there's something somebody you can do with videos. And we should talk, I guess, a little bit about what the technology is about, uh, about dealing with deep fakes. This really breaks down into two categories. The first is deep fake detection after the fact. So there's a video, here's a video, is it real or not? And Microsoft and Facebook and others have technology now that, that they're working on that it's sort of being improved to detect and they use very di variety of different ways of doing this. It, they basically give you a confidence score on whether or not this thing was manipulated. Sometimes it looks at the way the mouth moves, the way the eyes look, or sometimes heartbeats in the face, and do they match uh, sort of realistic uh, use, uh, realistic humans. Um, so that's, that's one example, and it does take some time, but I guess the idea is that there might be software interfaces on computers and in social media uh, sites and platforms and so forth that would give you that score more immediately and label things or remove them that are detected to be fake. And again, that gives you, the user, information. Whether or not you choose to believe it, I suppose, is, is a harder question. And then the other uh, technology is what's known as provenance media. And that kind of flips the equation on its head. And that says, let's not worry about showing what's fake. Let's, let's really prove what's true. And the idea there is that to use metadata and blockchain technology so that one photographs are taken or video is shot, that there's no way to manipulate it without leaving basically breadcrumbs. And by using the blockchain distributed ledger, it means that there's always going to be a reliable history of the, of the media. And uh, I mean, it depends a bit on, on a wide scale adoption because especially in the image context, you'll open an image and it'll have like a lock in the same way that you see like a lock on the URL bar of your web browser that shows that it uses a secure socket layer. There's gonna be a kind of uh, an image and this technology exists already so you can go online and see what I'm talking about. And you would click on the little button and it would show you the complete history of the image. And again, I think in that way, it's about um, changing technology to scale with the changing times and so that people will be skeptical of media that doesn't have that kind of provenance me, uh, metadata in it um so beg your pardon that was my laundry it's not finished um and so the uh in any event the so those are the two basic technologies take a pause there it sounds like the, you know, that sounds computationally quite heavy. I wonder what the impact environmentally is on having to always defend yourself, you know, lock your, <laughs> your, your doors against this sort of uh, infiltration. I guess also, um, you know, right now is probably when these technologies are most dangerous because we don't have sort of the social antibodies uh, built up yet to fight again. You know, these are mm -hmm. completely new things that people don't know about. I suppose as people learn uh, what they are, they'll learn to be a little bit more skeptical uh, about the things that are arriving in their inbox or that they're seeing on Twitter. Yeah, I think that that's right. I mean, I think I wrote a piece, a co-wrote with a, a dear colleague in front of mine, that the, when it comes to telling you know, truth and false, falsehood, there just isn't an app for that. And the strongest program we have is between our ears. And the idea being that sort of analytical thinking, rigor, healthy skepticism is very potent. Now, sometimes that can be turned maliciously 
And I see some of that actually in like anti-vaccine commentary where it's like, oh, I've got to do my own analysis. You know, <laughs> I'm going to trust what I think because I'm going to read a blog somewhere uh, versus what every you know, public health official <laughs> uh, based on, you know, hundreds of millions of uses is, is determining. But I do think that you're right. Uh, let me try another analogy. I have old, photo, old passports of my grandparents, grandfather, and it's just, a, it's just a photograph, like stapled inside the passport, right? There's not like any fancy holograms. But what happened was as technology got better, photographic technology got better, for, forgery technology got better, they changed passports. So now if someone showed me a passport with just a photograph stapled into it, sort of loose hanging with a staple, I would have reason to think that it might be a manipulated <laughs> passport. And now if you look at my passport, it's got the hologram and, you know, it has all these features to protect to make sure that you know that it's, it's true. And I feel like th there might be a similar kind of evolution, right? Where you just come to expect certain things from the media that you look at. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it's something that shows that it hasn't been manipulated uh, or perhaps it's a confidence score at the bottom uh, in a way that you didn't before. And I suppose that's a hopeful approach. I mean, that, that is the idea to think that, that there is an illness and then there's an antibody, not to extend our public health metaphor, but you know, the idea being that falsified imagery is a challenge and then there's a kind of social antibody that, a social and technological antibody that comes up after to sort of counter the, the illness. I guess there's also legal antibodies, right? From from a you know, who has jurisdiction? Because the internet's everywhere. Yeah. You know, do do we have laws in place uh, to deal with deep fakes and and other sort of media manipulation, or is that sort of being put into place now as as we're running along? So it, it is coming up now, and I can speak most authoritatively about the U.S. Um, I know, I'll tell you everything I know about other countries, which is not all that much. I know that in Korea and Japan they have had success using pre-existing laws about harassment to uh, uh, at least arrest individuals who used deep fakes to create deep fake porn, non-consensual deep fake pornography. And you know, in brief, that is, you use a non-consenting person's face, almost always a female celebrity, and you put it on a nude body in such a way that it creates a realistic nude image or nude video or pornographic video. And so I know that in uh, Korea and Japan, there have at least been a, reports of arrests based on pre-existing laws. And I know that in the UK, there's a movement, I was reading about it just the other day, to uh, change the law to, to make that illegal. In the US, uh, it's, it's really moving uh, hand over fist in terms of bills being introduced and now laws being passed. And you know, very briefly for those who don't know, you know, the U.S. is a federal system, so we have federal laws that are passed by the U.S. Congress, the House and the Senate, and signed by the president, and they apply to all states. And then we have laws by individual state. And in truth, it is most of the things that people worry about violating, most of the law that governs everyday life is, in fact, state law. And now seven states uh, have passed laws uh, against barring some kinds of deep fakes. And they, they really fall into, in the state level, they fall into to two categories, three, but there's, because that includes one outlier, I'll get to that. So the two main categories are laws against the circulation of election, of deep fakes about politicians in the run up to an election. And only two states do that, that's California and Texas. And uh, they're kind of complicated laws, California law is full of, of, um, of carve outs, and it's a civil law, which means you have to bring a lawsuit. The state doesn't say prosecute. And the Texas law, which bars the publication of deep fakes and distribution of them about a candidate defined in a certain way, about, I think, 90 days before an election, is a crime. It's actually a misdemeanor. And there, the law is written so broadly that it's, you know, politicians have claimed that run-of-the-mill advertising, where they show their opponent in a, in a you know, a, made to look in a menacing way is a deep fake, you know, qualifies as violating the law. So that's, neither law has ever been enforced. I should say that all the laws I'm going to talk about, I know of no case where any, any, uh, any case has been brought under these laws. So it's all very new, but the case law is moving in that direction. So those are, those are the elections. The second, the most popular uh, form of lawmaking bars non-consensual deep fake porn. 
So that is, let's see if I can get this right, that's California, where it's a civil crime, Hawaii, where it's a crime, Maryland, where it involves child porn, uh, nudes of children, Virginia, um, did I mention Wyoming, and New York. I believe that's mm-hmm. it. So, uh, and there, they vary whether or not there's civil wrongs in New York and California. That is, again, where the injured party would have to bring suit, bring a lawsuit, or their crimes, Hawaii, Wyoming, uh, Virginia, Maryland, or crimes. And that's the idea being that the, the state prosecutor would be like, you know, Virginia v. Smith would bring the, would bring the, the charges. And I think that that's pretty interesting in the U.S. context because typically those kinds of laws are sort of like revenge porn laws, anti-revenge porn laws, have lo- almost always been upheld. I should say almost always. There's solid ground to uphold those laws under the U.S. First Amendment, the First Amendment of the Constitution. So that's very popular. And I, I've often said that I think it's important to address that, the issue of deepfake porn, because it's an extant threat, like something like 95% of all deepfakes on the internet are, are deepfake pornography. Um, so people are getting harmed right now. You know, mm-hmm. I think hundreds of thousands of videos or images have, have been documented of being out there of uh, non-consenting people. I also think it's a good sort of beta testing because you can sort of see what works to prevent the spread. Is it criminal law? Is it civil law? Um, you know, how hard is it to prove, do, you know, would, how, what is the role of experts in testimony, that sort of thing. Um, and so I, I think that, that I just, I'm, I'm glad to see that that's happening because I think it's going to help sort of advance the lawmaking in this. And then I mentioned a third category. So let me pause on that. And that's New York. New York State is the only state in the nation to have created a statutory right for one's digital, digital replica after death, a post-mortem statutory right to a digital replica. And it depends, it's a little complicated, it's a complicated law, and it depends on whether or not the person makes money, is, like a, 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 is an actor while they're alive, makes money on their likeness. Um, and it has lots of carve-outs for like a newsworthy exception for uh, all kinds of, of things, whether or not if you put a disclaimer, that would also be a carve-out. But the idea there is essentially to protect, remember I talked about Carrie Fisher before, Mm -hmm. the the idea being that if she didn't want her likeness to be used after her death in a movie, um, her her heirs could control it. You have 40 Mm -hmm. years if you register with the state to control your likeness uh, after death. And so again, it's this idea of protecting someone's, uh, uh, basically property right in their own image. Like I said, there are lots of carve outs and involves only actors who will make money off of their likeness while they're alive. But I, I do think it's important for a step. A similar law newly passed in Louisiana. I would, I, I would expect another one, either in Louisiana, maybe California, given uh, the fact that Hollywood and actors are largely based in California. So I think you know, that's an area that you're going to see growth. And then there are some federal laws, although right now they're not prohibitions. The federal the four federal laws on deepfakes, they're all at this point reporting requirements or research bills. So they either direct research by the National Science Foundation or the National Institute of Science and Technology to come up with uh, standards for, for deepfakes or deepfake detection or their reports. The most important one was passed in December of last year of 2020. President Trump vetoed it for unrelated reasons. It was connected to uh, the defense policy bill. It was then then the Senate overrode, the Senate and the House overrode the veto. So it became law on New Year's Day 2021. And without going too into details, major portion of that law is called the Deepfake Report Act. And it requires the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, which is sort of our interior ministry, basically. That's perhaps too easy a uh, facile comparison. It's a bit of interior, um, uh, or home home minister, home official in the UK. But anyway, um, what it requires them to re- write a report every year for five years on the dangers of deepfakes across the entire range of harms. So from national security harms to civil rights harms, like the porn stuff, to business harms, everything. So really open the, the aperture to also look at technical countermeasures, uh, public education, and make recommendations to Congress. And I think 
that that's important because for those who know, a lot of times Congress will require these kinds of reports as predicates for future lawmaking. So the idea being that they'll require these reports and then you, you, uh, the reports come back and then Congress might write bills. You know, I don't think that we're particularly close to any kind of bans at the federal level, but you don't know. I mean, lots of bills have been introduced to ban uh, elect, uh, deepfakes around elections, to, to uh, ban deepfake porn uh, at the federal level and others. So we'll see. Uh, things move pretty slowly in Congress. So I think you'll see more activity at the state level. Probably another 10 states are considering bill, bills. Uh, and I guess you really won't be able to tell their efficacy until people start bringing claims or the states are mm -hmm. bringing um, uh, uh, criminal actions. So it'll be interesting. But that's, that's where the states are going. I mean, I actually think that People often talk about how, and I just made a reference to it myself, like how slow um, the legislatures are and how uh, you know government moves at the speed of wood. But this is an area where it's only been a couple of years and we already have seven laws on the books and many more are coming and we'll see how, how it works out. I mean, I think the issue with, uh, as a, just a final comment on this, the issue with changing, um, these anti-revenge porn laws that has happened in Wyoming and in Virginia, because um, that's what they did, to include computer-generated imagery, that is to say deepfakes, I think is, is inspired. I think it makes a lot of sense. And Hawaii passed a new law, uh, New, York, new York amended its old law, and Maryland, as I mentioned, expanded its criminal law against child porn to include computer-generated imagery, which is sometimes called morphed pornography. Um, so in any event, it's, uh, it's an area where I think lawmakers are moving. In terms of legal definitions of deep fakes, you know, one thing that I'd be wondering about is, say, for example, someone went and made some deep fake pornography, but then they stated on the website, this is, you know, this is simulated, this is synthetic media. Um, would that then not be a deep fake by the definition of the law? You know, because you could imagine bypassing these laws if, if they were written in such a way, and then this might propagate anyway online through people who either knowingly or unknowingly don't read or, you know, th through the usual channels, right? So yeah. you, you might have the negative effects without having yeah. the legal repercussions. Th th that is a great question, and it's one actually addressed in most of these laws. Uh, so the, I mentioned the two sort of main buckets were the laws that counter uh, deepfakes around elections, and then the laws that counter deepfake porn. The ones about deepfake elections, at least in California, if you put a disclaimer, uh, it, it defeats liability. It's okay to do that if there's a disclaimer. Usually, I mean, they do that basically to protect satire. But it's not a defeat of liability to put a disclaimer on porn, on deepfake porn. And that's true uh, in New York. That's true in, uh, by explicitly in the statute in the California, the two laws in California, one on deepfake porn, one on um, elections. And um, yeah, it, it, so there are explicit uh, call outs to that in those laws. And in the others, um, I'm thinking of Hawaii. I don't think that there's an explicit statement on the, the fact that if it's merely labeled uh, uh, doesn't defeat liability, but basically the fact that it doesn't say that means that there would be no safe harbor. So yeah, in, in that case, uh, it doesn't matter. Typically they narrow responsibility by requiring what's called specific intent, which says mm -hmm. that you have to send this thing knowingly and intentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea there is that you have to intend to do something uh, specific with your bad act, with, with the act. So you have to intend to harm someone. Usually it's something like intend to harm someone knowing that this thing is fake. Mm -hmm. So, so if you were to get a deep fake porn and you're really concerned because you think that it needs to be reported to the police, mm -hmm. you could send it to the police. So you would be distributing it probably within the meaning of the statute, but you wouldn't be violating it because you're not doing it with intent, with the intent to harm anyone. Uh, and indeed, some some of these statutes, California comes to mind, have specific call outs for if you're reporting or doing anything in the judicial process, there's no liability. Mm -hmm. So and that's, that's a way of narrowing liability, because you had asked, 
does it matter if there's a disclaimer? Mm -hmm. And in all cases, uh, that is not, uh, in all cases where we pass laws, that is not uh, a way to defeat liability, merely having a disclaimer. So that seems like, oh, well, it's going to capture a lot of people. Maybe maybe the law is overbroad. Well, one way to cut down on the overbreadth of a law is to have a specific intent requirement. So the government has to show, or the plaintiff you bring a lawsuit, that the person acted knowingly and intentionally to do this bad thing. Mm-hmm. We might get to a point where, uh, just staying on the pornography thread, you might have a situation in the future where you don't ever I- even need actors anymore. You, know, you might have oh, yeah. completely simulated. Yeah. There's um, a figure out there that says that they think by 2030, so within the decade, some really high percentage of all media, 90% will be synthetic. Now, that seems a little high to me, but I suppose a lot can change in nine years. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, one area where synthetic media has been coming up in advertising, we talked about advertising earlier in our podcast is where they want more ethnically diverse models and such. And so somewhat diabolically, I think they haven't been necessarily hiring them. They've just been using synthetic media to create faces and complexions that are, that are variant to, um, to meet sort of certain representational goals. And I think that is a concern for people who make money off of their looks and whatever. Um, now, one one way would one way I suppose would be to do the thing that we talked about before, which is where you kind of become famous for X or Y reason, and then you just sort of license your look. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, if it's if it's nobody owns it, that is another issue. And I actually that is another issue about deepfakes. Who owns a deepfake hasn't really been settled because mm-hmm. typically, like the, Tim, the 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 Tom Cruise TikTok videos, like Chris May is a good example. So he train those his algorithm on on imagery of tom cruise i don't know this to be true to be a fact but i think it's likely that he used movies and Mm -hmm. you know images that would be copyrighted because they copyright would be owned by the movie production company but under typical intellectual property law in the u.s there's fair use provisions and there's transformational provisions where if you transform something significantly it, it ends the IP protection, but it, no one has quite yet determined how transformational a deep fake is, especially where in a situation like that, you're going to have hundreds, mm-hmm. if not thousands of inputs. So then really, what is, what is left of the original? There's a famous example involving Kim Kardashian West, although I guess she got a divorce, so she might just be Kim Kardashian <laughs> again now. So Kim Kardashian, it's been a, lot, a while since Kim and I spoke, so I, yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, but Kim uh, Kardashian shot a video for Vogue magazine and um, an anti-advertising activist took that video and used uh, defect technology to change her mouth movements and made it sound like she was saying things she never said and posted it online. Condé Nast company, which owns uh, Vogue, had the copyright to that video because they had produced it and the, the sort of the, the video on which the deep fake was based. And that was an example where there, the input wasn't so confusing. It was clear that it was this um, Condé Nast Vogue video. It wasn't like Chris who had hired an actor and only replaced, you know, so much of the face. So they went to the platforms and they said, this is our copyrighted material, please take it down. And, and they did, because under U.S. law, if you put a platform on notice that it's uh, hosting copyrighted material without the permission of the rights holder, in almost all circumstances, it has to come down. So that's an example where IP law was able to be used in a deep context to remove content online. But I think that is a very open question, you know, who's going to actually own this stuff and in the U.S., the regulating body of the Patent and Trademark Office has asked for comments from sort of the industry. I know that the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, has done as well. And I think it's going to be an iterative process while they try to figure it out who actually owns a deep fake that comes from so many composite sources. Huh. What about at the level of companies? So say, for example, I, you know, Coca-Cola 
mm. releases some anti-advertisement like they show people dying from drinking pepsi or something like this so that, <laughs> you know uh, you know everything you've said so far has sort of been at the level of the individual but are, are there sort of separate laws at the level of companies uh, how, how does it work well there? well you can still hold the a company can still be held viable um it, it, there's like some uh it varies a little bit and you have to hold usually an individual within the company to hold the company itself liable and so forth but um but no you yeah if if pepsi were to defame um coca-cola or vice versa um usually that would in the u.s that would be considered trade liable which is a kind of defamation specifically about someone's product that's sold in commerce uh, and there are other laws as well there's tortious interference with prospective economic advantage which is a way in which i i interfere with your you're another business and i interfere uh with your business with a third party so like i it's like this interesting kind of um position where I'm not actually a party to this transaction, this third party transaction, but I am, um, uh, you know, I'm doing something to harm your business and then you can sue me. Um, so that usually happens. It's kind of similar to defamation, it varies a little bit by state because it changes by state. So yeah, I mean, I think that that is an area where you can see um, litigation and and debate because i think there are going to be kind of gloves are off sort of thing and there's been some examples of deep fake tech used by companies so far usually in an average usually in advertising but to your point sometimes the advertising can go a little bit too far and i do think that when someone asks me oh what do you think about the legality of this or that deep fake i often say well let's dig in let's see what the, what how is the defect being used what is it saying because that's the more interesting thing and i'll let's talk about the tom cruise TikTok for a second so there uh, chris's work which is really fabulous you know, if you haven't seen it anyone out there please check it out it's, it's deep tom cruise is the handle um he like is playing golf he's kind of cracking wise you know telling jokes he's doing a magic trick it's like really kind of fun and interesting and light but if instead of doing those things, he looked at the camera and he said, hi, I'm Tom Cruise. And um, I just want to tell you that Mission Impossible 7 is canceled. And I am never going to work with the movie studio that produces Mission Impossible ever again, because they're all a bunch of crooks and they've stolen my money. And maybe this CEO is like a, sexual harasser something you know really like harvey weinstein on steroids and i call on all of my fellow a-list celebrities to never work with this movie studio and this producer ever again uh, i'm tom cruise and i approve this message right like what if he said that hmm. and what if uh the producer of that video let's let's, let's for this, the purposes of this hypo let's assume it's not chris somebody else some other party um had taken a short position in the stock hmm. of that movie studio and so the stock drops because of this you know this statement all the a-listers are no longer going to work with this movie studio and it's helmed by a sexual predator um well first of all the fraudster would likely be liable under um, the securities and exchange laws in the united states the securities act uh for fraud uh, and then the the movie studio could probably bring a trade libel claim or something like it and the individual that was defamed because he was called a sexual uh, aggressor, assaulter, could also bring a defamation claim. So in that case, what would otherwise have been kind of a fun deep fake because it, you know, is probably, except for that sort of esoteric IP question, nothing illegal about those Tom Cruise TikToks, um, all of a sudden becomes something that's quite actionable. So that's, that's just what I, that I talk about when I think about talk and think about these deep fakes. It's like, it's not just whether or not it's true or false. It's like, what is it actually doing? And ditto with the Anthony Bourdain um, post-mortem, you know, where he's reading his own email. This is, again, this just happened where in a documentary he, he read an email, uh, a synthetic voice of him was, was used to read an email. Anthony Bourdain died three years ago. And so, you know, that's, probably doesn't violate any laws and newsworthy exceptions and so forth. But if instead the forger had said, um, gosh, I really wish I had, you know, bought Bitcoin or, uh, you know, uh, 
I really want to call on all my fans to donate to this bogus charity that the forger has created, right? All of a sudden that becomes uh, actionable uh, disinformation. So I think a good uh, direction to finish off on since mm-hmm. you're running into your next meeting yes, soon sorry. is, uh, you know, if you were to paint a picture of the future of this technology in sort of broad strokes, uh, what's, what's your image of the, of the place in our society moving forward of this technology, broadly speaking? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that they're going to become far more common. So that's like element one. You're going to just have deep fakes much more often instead of talking in the abstract about the deep fake of the stock uh, of the you know uh, acquisition of one company of another by one company of another uh, that somebody did so as to prom- uh, promote a stock surge uh, and then benefit from um, from the fraud that's going to actually happen right uh, and then you're going to have many more deep fakes used to try to enter computer systems and sort of cause this. Uh, this sort of credential theft stuff that we talked about before. So it's going to be, this, well, it's just going to be like another danger vector, sort of like a cyber vector. So uh, there are going to be much greater like reputational risks for companies. Uh, and then I do think that we're going to see a more um, technological developments to try to try to prevent them, detect them, label true media with sort of province technology. So I think expect now to our discussion before to be called upon to be a more critical consumer of media to know the difference between true and fake. Um, and, I, and I think that we can expect more laws as well. And so it's going to, it's going to change society in the same way that I think cameras, photography, video recording, audio recordings, have changed as well. Uh, doesn't mean society ends. It just means that it gets uh, different, and um, it just changes. And the, the challenges, as long as well as uh, very interesting possibilities, especially with the arts and accessibility. Somebody said that uh, defect technology is a what was the word? A uh, multiplier of human intentions. I think it was. So that it, so it's it's simply it's everything that humans would otherwise do now with synthetic media. Mm-hmm. Everything on steroids. So it, it is in steroids. some sense uh, revolutionary. <laughs> to get back to the yeah. very first question I asked you. Yeah, I think I think it is revolutionary, and I I, I like that um, phrase because revolutions don't have solutions. You know what I mean? So it's not like deep fakes are going to be solved, or going to be ended, or going to be put back into a bottle. Um, in, the, in the same way that the Re- French Revolution was not ended or solved or, you know, uh, put back in a bottle. It's just, it's just life moved on from there. And I do think that that's going to be something similar with synthetic media, that it's just going, it's going to be a revolution in the way in which we, we perceive of and consume media. Um, but, uh, it, but it's not all bad and it's not all good. And like everything else, it's, it's just a lot like life, which is somewhere in the middle. Matt, it's been fascinating. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> on the podcast. Thank you, Jen. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I've, say, I've watched um, some, um, some of your shows before and I really like them. So just a real pleasure to be on with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome back anytime. Cheers. All righty. Cheers. Escaped Sapiens.